So what we'll do is look into that process and see how it goes about uh, describing it. Now, uh, Freer says, um, first of all, despite many good intentions, um, they typically, not always, but they typically, at this level, they typically retain their biases. If I am from a privileged class, if I'm from a privileged group, it is typically the case that I retain my bias. Um, and actually, in, in religious tradition, I think the greatest story, one of the greatest stories ever told, you don't have to necessarily be Buddhist yourself, but um, the Buddha came from a very, a very uh, opulent family. Right? He came from a, a very privileged class. And he relinquished all of that class. He, he freed himself of all of that class. He denied himself all the things that he had as basically heir to the throne so that he could have and create a camaraderie with the man on the street. Um, it's through this process of relinquishing one's privilege that one can truly then say that I have a recognition and understanding of the oppressed. Um, an individual who attempts to move from an oppress, oppressor, OPP, an oppressor class, um, it actually go this way, an oppressor class to an oppressed class, is called a convert. Right? So the convert attempts to seriously, systematically, relinquish his or her um, oppressor bias, right? his privilege, his or her privilege, and recognize, truth, truly recognize the, the problems, the subordination of those who are oppressed by relinquishing that bias. Um, and Freire acknowledges this, he just says that there are, there are certain things that they must do in order to truly get rid of that bias. Um, the first thing that you can't do is that you can't attempt to think for the oppressed group, right? If you go in there as an academic, for example, me as an academic, very, very privileged position, doing work with, um, with uh, communities that have been wrought with genocide, I fly to um, the Sudan and I immediately start telling uh, members of the indigenous population how they should operate and how they should rebuild their communities. Well, obviously all I'm doing is I'm instantiating a new level of oppression, right? Why? Because I think because the educational experience that I have and the research that I've done, I know and they don't know. That's categorically wrong, right? I cannot attempt to think for these individuals. What I do is I incentivize them to think for themselves, right? I can, I can help in transforming the population, but I cannot transform the population myself, right? And as we said before, the oppressor does not lead the revolution. The oppressed lead the revolution. So the only contribution that I can do as an individual from a privileged class is to help, right? Is to help in educating what I'm doing right now, pedagogy, help in educating so that they have the tools to think for themselves. I cannot go into the community and make the decisions and think for the population and think that I'm freeing the population because actually all I'm doing is further subordination, right? is further uh, subordinating, subordinating the population. Um, uh, they, they want to bring about, and this is the oppressor, right? They want to bring about the OTR, the Objective Transformation of Reality. Remember, it's a technical term that he uses. OTR is simply the objective transformation of reality. You can go back and watch in previous videos the definition of that. Um, all that is the objective transformation of reality is a transformation from a state of oppression to a state of mutual, equal recognition and humanization. Um, but they cannot, right? The oppressor cannot because this responsibility, this is a responsibility of the oppressed. It's the oppressed responsibility to bring about the objective transformation of reality. Right? The oppressed have to do it. So I can, as a convert, right, this, this would be the act of conversion, C-O-N-V-E-R-T, I can, as a convert, um, understand and gain glimpses into the oppression of groups, but I cannot make the, and I cannot bring about the objective transformation of reality by myself as a privileged, as a member of a privileged group. What I can do is, I can help in the education of the oppressed, but through that education, they have to formulate their own emancipation. It is not for me to formulate that emancipation. And even there, there are caveats even in that act, but we'll get to that later uh, in uh, chapter three about how that uh, unfolds. I think it's chapter three, how that unfolds. Converts, according to uh, Freer, converts fail to trust people. Right? They fail to trust people because they recognize the systematization of oppression. Converts typically fail to trust the oppressed, not always, but 
in most, in some cases rather, in some cases the convert fails to trust the oppressed because they recognize how this system of, technically speaking, structural violence has led to the oppression. They know what they're capable of. As a member of the privileged class, I know what I'm capable of doing. I know what I'm capable of doing. So when I enter a community of oppressed people, I'm immediately cautious, right? And I, I immediately don't want to trust members of the oppressed group, despite the fact that I want to help them. Freer says that um, an act of trust, however, is essential for the objective transformation of reality. You cannot get to an objective transformation of reality unless this convert, in the act of conversion, trusts. Right? I have to trust the oppressed group. I have to have a trust built in with the oppressed group. I have to believe that we share camaraderie. I have to believe um, what they're saying um, I cannot impose, right? I have to listen to. It's a, I, have to, I have to really humble myself. I have to deny myself all the privilege that I have access to. I have to humble myself so that I can see what it is that, uh, in the nature of their oppression. It's only through this that we can arrive at the objective transformation of reality. And even if I trust, I still can't arrive at it myself. I can only access it through uh, members of the oppressed group. Um, what... Freer says, and it's, it's, a, it's a great line, I actually should have quoted it, I never quoted it, um, but he basically says, trust is more important than generosity, right? I could, you can imagine, um, in, in a disaster uh, scenario, um, wield out tons of money, right? Just give out tons of money. I could just send tons of tons of money, uh, acts of generosity to help these poor people. But as we saw in the first few videos, uh, this act of generosity is what's known as false generosity. This act of charity is known as false charity because I'm sending money to rebuild, but I am not sending money to bring about the liberation of this oppressed group. Insofar as my monetary donation is only um, to rebuild or to maintain the status quo or even bring about further oppression, my act of charity, my act of generosity is false charity, is false generosity. The only true generosity, true charity for a year um, are acts that result, one, from trust, and two, from an attempt, a serious attempt, to bring about the liberation of those who are already oppressed, right? So, for a year, trust is better than generosity. Keep your false charity, keep your money, keep your generosity. Uh, what we need is trust, right? Converts cannot seek, next point, converts cannot seek to impose or define the nature of revolution, right? It is not up to the converts to determine how we arrive at the objective transformation of reality. And we recognize that this is through the struggle, right? The way that we get here is through struggle, right? But it's the struggle of the oppressed, right? It is not the struggle of the convert. The convert um, is now not like the oppressor, right? The convert has, an, um, if you will, the, the convert has some biases of, a few biases of the oppressor, the convert may have lived a life of privilege. The convert sheds that life of privilege in order to gain camaraderie with the oppressed, but it is still primarily and exclusively the oppressed obligation to struggle for this objective transformation of reality. Um, he says, Freer says that this, the act of conversion is an act of rebirth, right? It is just transformation. And in the example of the Buddha, the Buddha example is, is perfect, right? Buddha uh, became who we have known him to be in his act of denying, of relinquishing his connection to the world, right? Um, another uh, very, very old, uh, ancient, uh, super obscure, but I've, I've done research on him before, um, Indian philosopher known as Patanjali. Patanjali has the same sort of motif, and the motif is a denial, relinquishing my connection to the world. Insofar as deny myself the pleasures of the world, insofar as de I deny myself material objects, possession, ownership, I reach a state of enlightenment. Right? It's it doesn't have to be that intense, but that's the general that's the general idea. Right? 